New Year, New Me, New Year, episode 43 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. Thank you all once again for joining me. If you're on the YouTube channel, don't forget to click like, smash the subscriber bell, flip on the notifications if you haven't done so already. On the audio platform, same general rule applies. If you've enjoyed the content, don't forget to click like and subscribe, whether Spotify, iTunes, or the other platforms. Since we're in 2024, a topic of conversation when we think of uh, brand name movies, when we think of franchises, when we think of sequels and an awful lot of intellectual property and content, Star Wars is one of those kind of magical names in every possible sense of that phrase. Now, I am a big fan. If somebody says, do you like Star Wars? I think about how much that takes in. How many different movies, tie-ins, animated series, video games, recent TV series, and or Obi-Wan, Clone Wars, there's a lot of different programs from movies to TV to other forms of media that fall under the umbrella of Star Wars. Well, for purposes of today, I'm just going to talk about the nine Star Wars movies that are considered, here's my NYU film school word, canon, C-A-N-O-N. The nine movies in the Star Wars saga that began all the way back in 1977, May 4th, hence the phrase, may the 4th be with you. Not may the 4th be with you, may the 4th be with you. May 4th. As time has gone on, I have been amused and distressed and bewildered in equal measure by the number of self-proclaimed diehard Star Wars fans who appear to hate the franchise. Now, I'm somebody who, I don't want to say got in late to the party. My first experience seeing this movie right here, what is now known as Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, I watched it at home on HBO when I was nine years old on a 13-inch television, and I absolutely loved it. Every frame of it otherworldly, literally, figuratively, symbolically. Never seen anything like it. I was completely blown away on that tiny TV with normal sound. Didn't see any of the original four, five, and six. And that's what's weird for people who don't know. They say, wait a minute, so the original three were episodes four, five, and six? Yeah, George Lucas kind of fit things around those stories. Because look, no matter how many ideas he had, um, the only movie he could make is the movie that 20th Century Fox would fund, meaning the story ideas he had and or the screenplay ideas that he had. So he made episodes four, five, and six. 1977, 1980, 1983. Episode four, A New Hope. Episode five, Empire Strikes Back. Episode six, supposed to be Revenge of the Jedi, and then there was an idea, well, Jedis really don't take revenge, so Return of the Jedi. The old Revenge of the Jedi posters, not surprisingly, became big collector's item because that was supposed to be the title of the movie, and then cooler heads prevailed. Man, we don't really need to use the word revenge. Not necessary. But I didn't see a Star Wars film on the big screen until 1997, when George Lucas and company, and when I say and company, I mean and Hollywood at large, they knew they were going to make the so-called prequel trilogy. And they decided to put the originals spruced up, special effects added, some things tinkered with, some scenes digitally enhanced, other scenes brought back in that didn't exist in the original incarnation but they put the three movies back in theaters and they were all successful, especially this one. And I saw this one 
at age 23 at the old Movies at Sunrise Mall, my first time seeing it on the big screen. I had already watched this film at least 15 times, start to finish. Seeing it on the big screen was extraordinary. So it is safe to say I am a fan of the franchise. Here's where it gets strange. Because when I hear of the phrase militant, you know, we always think politics. I don't necessarily always think politics. My first thought is baseball. And going back to the 90s, a lot of the kind of Met Yankee back and forth once talk radio, sports talk radio became a big deal and the internet started to take hold. A militant fan is a fan who roots for his team and actively roots against another team. So I was a militant Yankees fan going back before that, going back to the mid eighties. I was a Yankees fan who actively wished death, well not death, but destruction, spiritual death, sporting death, meaning you're not gonna win the World Series. The season is gonna go into a spiral. I rooted for disaster for the New York Mets. I hated them to the core. A militant Yankees fan. Now, I still root against the Mets, but I don't delight in their misery as I once did. And on the other hand, there are plenty of Mets fans that their favorite team, other than the Mets, whoever's playing the Yankees, I hope the Yankees lose every game 20 to nothing. When it comes to Star Wars, it's a little bit different. And this is a kind of troubling aspect. It's something that's bothered me since the prequels came out. So again, you have these three movies, A New Hope, Empire, Jedi. A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi. Most Star Wars fans really like those movies. And if you were to ask the average person who identifies as fans of the film series from, let's say, ages 20 to 60, we'll make it that 20 to 70. Those three movies, in my opinion, will be named. Some version of those three movies will be in the top three, more so than any other three movies out of the nine. Okay, so that, that's true. That's a thing that I believe is accurate. I wouldn't say that I love the original trilogy equally. I still prefer this one. It has one of the single greatest moments, spoiler alert, in a history of cinema for me as a fan and scholar. The moment towards the end of A New Hope where Skywalker is about to be picked off, killed by Vader, who doesn't seem to know quite yet who he is. Han Solo, who has already basically given the double middle finger salute to everyone, only cares about money, was actually bluffing. He was Teddy KGB, not eating the Oreos. He doesn't have it. He was bluffing, and he made everyone believe that he was a soulless mercenary when he actually was not a soulless mercenary. Solo coming to Luke Skywalker's aid to this day might be my single favorite moment in a history of cinema, of my movie-going life. On the strength of that alone, this is my favorite Star Wars movie. Purists, and I would say that Empire Strikes Back is the best if we're talking from the kind of technical craftsmanship, storytelling performance, and what they were able to do with special effects in 1980, very impressive. Empire Strikes Back is probably the best film. Return of the Jedi, for the first hour plus, is just as good as the first two, and then the little Ewoks running around. They don't ruin the movie, but the level of quality is not the same. This is generally accepted as reality by most Star Wars fans that I have come into contact with, even reading online, younger fans getting into the series later, have no trouble easily latching onto episodes four, five, and six. You'll see mover reactors consistently, you know, young people in many cases who are not film fans till they got into doing this, we're like, holy shit, we had no idea these movies were so good. All the hype is real. I thought people were just trying to get us to watch the movies because they just wanted to. But I get why this became what it is. So I remember when the prequel trilogy 
came out, summer 1999, the first one, episode one, Phantom Menace, showing how it's years before Luke Skywalker, a couple of decades at least, before Luke Skywalker was born, and the events of episode four. We see how Darth Vader got his start. And it was an interesting, for me, an interesting conceptual thing that you start to see, okay, so the main character in George Lucas's entire sprawling saga is not Luke Skywalker. At least it doesn't seem that he is. It seems that it's his dad, Anakin, a.k.a. Vader. Oh, my God, spoiler alert. OMG, spoiler alert. So excitement factor and anticipation factor for Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. They got a great cast together, very young Natalie Portman, playing who ends up becoming the mom of Princess Leia and Luke, spoiler alert. Liam Neeson as a Jedi Master was brilliant casting, so good. Qui-Gon Jinn, his performance is one of the highlights of the entire series for me. But the early buzz, people saw the preview trailer and it looked spectacular. Now, if we cancel out all of the extraneous noise I enjoyed all three of the prequels. Phantom Menace in 1999, Attack of the Clones, Episode 2, in 2002, and Revenge of the Sith in 2005. No extraneous background noise, no people screaming bloody murder on Star Wars message boards or the internet movie database or people in the gym cursing me out because I said, I like The Phantom Menace. Get rid of all of that shit. I enjoyed all three. None of them could hold a candle to any of the original trilogy, but they did not ruin my childhood. They didn't destroy the concept of Star Wars. No, they just weren't as good as the original trilogy. Now, when those movies, when Phantom Menace came out, there were tons of very disappointed Star Wars fans. George Lucas wrecked my childhood. Fuck George Lucas. George Lucas is the Antichrist. George Lucas is soulless. Whatever. I'm being nice. The vitriol directed at George Lucas and the production team and craftspeople and people who spent years preparing Phantom Menace. Awful. They were just as vicious with Attack of the Clones. Revenge of the Sith, it seemed to be a little lighter because Revenge of the Sith takes you just, you know, maybe a decade and a half, two decades before the events of Star Wars A New Hope. Now, I, the prequel trilogy, for me, the effectiveness drops as the movies go. I really like The Phantom Menace, even though there's a lot of just gobbledygook that wasn't necessary. I mean, if I have to hear somebody talk about the Trade Federation and the blockade, like, I can't stand that shit. And Jar Jar Binks, Misa, Yusa, bad, terrible character. The movies work, uh, excuse me, that movie works. Even though Jake Lloyd was miscast as Anakin Skywalker, he looks the part, doesn't come across as well as he could. But Natalie is great. Man was even McGregor perfectly cast. And Liam Neeson holds it together. He makes you believe. His performance elevates the film massively. And so Phantom Menace, despite the flaws I mentioned, is to me the most rewatchable of the trilogy. Every moment where Liam Neeson holds the screen is riveting. Like he didn't become a star by accident. He wasn't, this is way before the Taken movies where he gained a new, like John Wick style, gained a new generation of younger fans. He and McGregor are so good. It elevates. Attack of the Clones I did not think was particularly good. It was entertaining. I saw it twice in theaters. I've seen it a few more times. Doesn't work as well for me as Phantom Menace. And Revenge of the Sith, I'm just not a fan of. I know that it's uh, many people consider it the best of the original trilogy, but eh, doesn't do it for me. You know, and I love Hayden Christensen. I think he's terrific in other movies, in the Star Wars films, in the Obi-Wan series. In Ashoka, terrific. Great that he was able to come back and play the character again. Fucking great. 
So I was a fan and am still a fan of the prequel trilogy. I never subscribed to the noise about how disgusting they are. And also, I didn't accept the anger of fans screaming again, bloody murder, because George Lucas dared to tinker with his films. Okay, he didn't do a Ted Turner colorizing movies that were in black and white. Because that, that was something that a, a purist like me, I didn't appreciate that. And one of the greatest quotes, Orson Welles was a quote machine, if you don't know who that was. He was one of the most talented people to ever work in the movie business. Basically got fucked. He got fucked out of the career he should have had. But Orson Welles, the top five all-time movie quotes, when Ted Turner and TBS and TNT back in the early 80s, Turner made an announcement that, you know what, I feel like I, I want to stay ahead of the, the, the trends and feel like there's a lot of great black and white movies that if we are able to colorize them, they'll be more accessible for current audiences. Like, I understand what he was trying to do and it... it Ted Turner didn't become Ted Turner by being stupid, but in this instance, he was wrong. And Orson Welles, God rest that man's soul, his quote about doing that, he said, keep Ted Turner and his goddamn Crayolas away from my movies. <laughs> keep him and his goddamn Crayolas away from my movies. So I do appreciate films in their fixed form, but I understand that art can be living and George Lucas, there were things that he wanted to do originally with the original trilogy that he wasn't able to do because the special effects at the time, there were certain shots that simply could not be achieved that then could be completed. Star Trek, the motion picture, okay, which was only made because of the success of Star Wars and because that's, you know, the studio with Paramount, they couldn't get together the TV series they were trying to do, which was Star Trek Phase Two. So they made a movie, they rushed it to theaters, there were special effects shots that weren't finished. There were things that the terrific filmmaker Robert Wise wanted to do, could not do. 20 years later, with the advent of DVD and the additional revenues it could bring in, Robert Wise was allowed to finally, at age 70, however old he was, he was able to finish his film. And Star Trek Motion Picture, the director's edition, I argue is a great movie. The version that hit theaters in 79, eh, same basic story but the film felt unfinished and then felt finished. So I had zero issues with George Lucas going back and tinkering with the original trilogy. So you had certain segments of Star Wars fandom that were boiling mad that George Lucas tinkered with the original trilogy. These aren't the Star Wars films we grew up with. Fuck George Lucas. Get over yourself. Oh, and also the prequels all sucked. George Lucas destroyed my childhood. Okay. So that's the first six. Episode one, two, three, the prequel trilogy, the OG trilogy, four, five, and six. But the general sense after the prequel trilogy concluded in 2005, disaster. The general sense was the prequel sucked. Blown opportunity. What a disaster. Okay, now fast forward to episodes seven, eight, and nine. Force Awakens, I believe, was it 2014, and then it was 2017 for Episode 8, and I believe 2019 for Episode 9. Force Awakens opened to great reviews, and a lot of people just didn't really like it. The confusion over Rey's background, well, who were really her parents? Did Kylo Ren have to be this much of an asshole? Does Adam Driver have to walk around without a shirt on? Whatever people were arguing about. A new generation, allegedly, of fans who were, to me, just militant fans who seemed to, they, they proclaimed that they loved the, fr the, the franchise, but all they did was bellyache. Now, suddenly, you have people today saying, episodes seven, eight, and nine are all garbage. They destroyed George Lucas's vision. Disney screwed Look, George Lucas's vision. J.J. Abrams screwed the pooch. He fucked up. This is disgusting. This is not the Star Wars we grew up with. And the same exact bullshit repeats anew. And it, somebody like me, who understands the history and understands the context, 
I am still scratching my head trying to understand how these, and there's hundreds of thousands. This is not a couple of people. This is not one segment of Star Wars fandom. This is an enormous amount of people who claim to be diehard Star Wars fans. And all they do is complain and complain and complain. Hey, life's too short. This is not baseball. And even with me, all those years hating the Mets, got over it. I still don't wish them to win any games, but I'm not obsessed with it. I'm not staying up till 2 a.m. to watch the Mets on the West Coast when they're already 10 games under 500 because maybe I'll get a charge out of them losing again. So I don't get the thrill or the need to be so damn negative all the time. All nine Star Wars movies were entertaining. None of them were disastrously bad. If you want to ask me, what do I think is the worst film out of nine? Attack of the Clones, which to me had one good scene. Yoda and Count Dooku, the uh, lightsaber fight. Fucking riot. And it's one of the greatest scenes in the history of Star Wars. It's got to be top five. It's so stupid. And it's all CGI. You know, you had Christopher Lee, great old actor. Sir Christopher Lee, the man who I believe had more film credits than anybody in the history of cinema. Guy who knew J.R.L. Tolkien, for fuck's sake. He was in the British Royal Air Force. He was friends with Muhammad Ali. What a fucking boss that guy was. Great casting. You know, Lucas really pulled that one out of his ass. You know, let's use Christopher Lee. He looks, the guy still looks tremendous. Let's do it. So he was pushing 80 at the time. But the lightsaber battle, they had to kind of work around the fact that Christopher Lee was older. He couldn't move like he did during the Dracula days in the 50s where he was, you know, very lived, almost like a ballerina. And it was done in a computer. And what I remember about that was thinking that Yoda, it was like Sonic the Hedgehog. Some of the moves that he was doing were like spinning and all sorts of shit. That was the worst movie of the nine. Still an entertaining film. Not a complete disaster. It just wasn't good. You know, like a lot of the Freudian stuff works. I, I, the other thing I like, I like the Freudian stuff. They hear you have Hayden Christensen, whose powers are growing. You know, the lightsaber, a little bit of a phallic symbol, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Freud's somewhere laughing. But when he meets Amidala, Padme, they haven't seen each other in 10 years. His name is Anakin. But what does she call him? She calls him Annie. <laughs> Symbolic. Talk about chopping somebody off at the ankles, huh? That movie is weak. It, but it was just, I don't think that they focused on the right stuff in that particular story. That's all. I didn't see any sinister forces at work or George Lucas just pissing all over the fan base. Sometimes you just don't make a great movie. That's the way it goes in Hollywood. You got a lot of people in your ear telling you sometimes what you want to hear instead of what you need to hear. And Lucas, I feel like just, and he also didn't have as much control over that one as he did over Phantom Menace, which he actually directed. All nine movies are worth seeing. They're all good. But I was, what I found astounding is that many of the people, in this instance, was, would be mostly people under 35, who did not like 7, 8, 9. It doesn't mean they hated every frame of all three films, but they felt that they just they just couldn't figure out what to do with the character of Ray. And Kylo Ren's character really doesn't make much sense when you think about it. They were almost... What would be the word? Revisionist. Revisionist history acting like the prequel trilogy was an unqualified success. Now they fucked up Star Wars. So you had a whole new generation of people. Now it's assumed that the first six Star Wars movies were all terrific and J.J. Abrams and company fucked up 789 because studio interference, because J.J. this, because Mark Hamill that, because Carrie Fisher this, because Adam Driver sucks. Adam Driver, I think, is a brilliant actor. But that's beside the point. You can argue the character could have been written better, but he's recently talked about the fact that what he signed up for was not what we saw. That the original 
conception of the character was not what ended up happening. So again, you have a lot of cooks in the broth and sometimes you make a wrong choice. But it doesn't mean that your childhood is ruined or that Star Wars is dead to me. You know, it's like the joke that's been going around with Marvel, where Marvel also, there's so much content, some of it is good and some of it is shit. But when you come out with a TV series that you don't like, say, well, She-Hulk isn't good, I'm done with Marvel. Oh, Loki season two. Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Ant-Man Quantumania. Fucking piece of shit. I'm done with Marvel. Marvel's fucking sucks. Loki season two. Can't wait for Secret Wars. Are they going to get Downey Jr. back as Iron Man? How are they going to do that? People need to bring down the temperature a little bit. And don't get into the revisionist history. I mean, you can, you can get into the revisionist history. Don't get into it with somebody like me. Somebody who has a good memory and knows that when you now come across as if, well, it's understood that George Lucas knocked the prequel trilogy out of the park. Bullshit. Don't tell me that. You're changing your own narrative to suit whatever point you're trying to make. Episode 7, 8, 9, overall, were disappointing. But not for any overarching reason. Not because Hollywood went woke or J.J. Abrams was the wrong guy to be in charge of it. So here's the thing about J.J. Abrams. When he was hired for Star, uh, excuse me, Star Trek, there were people who were angry. But people are always angry. But a lot of people are saying, well, I mean, J.J.'s a talented guy, but he's not a Star Trek fan. He's a Star Wars diehard He did a great job with Star Trek. I think the Star Trek reboot is fantastic. It's up there with the best Trek films, even going back to the, you know, the William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, OG, Starship Enterprise. J.J. Abrams was a lifelong Star Wars fanatic. And what he was trying to do, starting with The Force Awakens, was to re redeem the elements in the prequel trilogy that people didn't like by doing things a little bit differently but you can't please everybody. And when it comes to Star Wars, you can't please anybody, apparently, because every segment of the fan base has massive issues either with the first three or the last three. And I have issues with the Ewoks, but I am a fan. And I love the Obi-Wan series from, was about a year and a half ago, fantastic. And I really liked Ashoka, I was surprised. Didn't see Andor but I really like Ashoka. I guess in general, when I think of franchises, I just wish people would enjoy rather than feel the need to get so angry about them. This isn't sports. This is not George Steinbrenner signing the wrong free agent in 1988. Why did he sign Jack Clark? We need pitching. Fuck George Steinbrenner. We could have had Jack Morris, piece of shit. More understandable. But the hand wringing and the rage, either in defense of George Lucas or in <laughs> pinata in George Lucas, not necessary. If you're a fan, act like one. Stop getting so pissed off over everything. Now, people are arguing about the end of Ashoka. Like, oh, what the fuck did they do? I'm not watching. I'm done with Star Wars. How about shut up and either watch or don't watch? Stop being so damn negative about it all the time. Anyway, I get hot about this because I am a fan, but I just don't understand the need to be so angry and negative and critical of these works of fiction, of fantasy that we claim to love. Do something else with your time, okay? Just a little pro tip from me. It's all good, one way or another. You can just watch them to enjoy them. And with that, we have come to the end of episode 43 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I want to thank you all once again for joining me on this January 1st of 2024. If you are checking this out on the YouTube channel and haven't done so already, please don't forget to click like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications so that you'll know when I've posted something new. I'll be back with episode 44 real soon. May the force be with you.
Take care.